that are experienced by sentient beings of the different realms. Uh, basically, the sufferings are classified into the three main types of sufferings. That is, uh, suffering of suffering, suffering of change, changing suffering, and uh, basic suffering that permeates sentient beings, so all pervasive suffering. <coughs> also, the different realms of existences are generally classified into the three worlds or three realms of existences. Uh, the realm of form, form and the realm of formlessness and the realm of desire. The devas or gods that inhabit the realm of formlessness and form, while there isn't a <clears throat> very acute experience of the way of happiness or that of direct experience of suffering, but their feelings are more in the realm of uh, uh, feelings of indifference. Nevertheless, the basic uh, <coughs> confusion of uh, uh, evil clinging existing and uh, there is the, uh, the, the predominant suffering is that of suffering of uh, the all pervasive suffering. And uh, within the realm of desire, <coughs> among the <coughs> gods of the realm of desire and human beings, the <coughs> uh, predominant suffering is suffering of change, 
whatever in the way of temporary happiness and well-being uh, such beings and such realms do experience that they constantly change the uh, changing resulting into experience of suffering then within the the other aspects of the realm of desire that is uh, beings of the three lower realms of existences and the other realms the predominant suffering is the direct experience of uh, sufferings of all kinds and therefore not only there is the basis for the experience of suffering because of belief in the ego but there is the actual direct experience of all kinds of sufferings so there is the experience of suffering of suffering so in this way the attention beings of the different realms of the three worlds three existences <coughs> experience the uh, three types of suffering ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、
Uh, among the uh, sufferings of uh, sentient beings of uh, other realms of existences, uh, we are not uh, directly aware of the sufferings of other uh, realms of existences since it is not within our uh, within the realm of our uh, visual perspective, except a bit of the beings of the animal realms. So we have some understanding and some sense of the sufferings from our personal, uh, personally having witnessed some uh, understanding of the sufferings of the uh, animals. And as far as our <clears throat> own sufferings as human beings. Then the sufferings of birth, sickness, old age and death. Out of these sufferings, while from the moment we um, entered the womb of the mother until uh, our birth, there had been experience of sufferings, Yet, uh, <clears throat> because of our ignorance, uh, such memory is presently obscured, obscured from our memory of that experience of suffering. Nevertheless, we did experience that suffering, so that suffering is the past. The sufferings of sickness in old age is something that is currently being experienced by us, that we are living through that, those faces of sufferings. And the suffering of death is uh, inevitable that we will experience in the future. And <clears throat> on top of these four sufferings, there are other, <clears throat> among various sufferings, there are other uh, four main sufferings. The, in the case of uh, those uh, uh, who are experiencing whatever uh, material lacking poverty, there is the uh, mental experience of agony and the physical suffering of so simply uh, struggling to survive. And so there is the mental and the physical sufferings of struggling to survive. And uh, the second suffering is, well, those who have whatever um, the comfortable physical and material and 
situations actually with abundance of wealth and what have you whereas the sufferings of uh, uh, losing sufferings of not being able to you know, secure <coughs> securely have them keep them so the sufferings of uh, uh, protecting and losing such and then <coughs> the third there is the suffering of separation the suffering of uh, separating from those loved ones, friends, family members, whoever, and the suffering of losing them because of our attachment to them. And the fourthly, the suffering of encountering <coughs> what is uh, undesir undesirable be it in the form of enemies, <coughs> harms, dangers, or, uh, <coughs> dangers of wilderness, dangers of enemies, <coughs> dangers of animals, what have you, but the sufferings of encountering what is undesirable. So within the human realm, well, there are all kinds of different sufferings, but uh, Mainly there are eight types of sufferings that human beings experience. And out of these eight types of sufferings, six of which <coughs> we currently experience in our lives, so we live through them, and uh, uh, two of which, one we had already experienced, the suffering of birth, one which we are on the going, moving forward, moving towards experiencing the suffering of death. <coughs> Full of all kinds of suffering, samsara is by nature suffering. And because of the uh, vastness of the sufferings of sentient beings, uh, is compared to that of an ocean, so referred to as the oceans of the sufferings of samsaric being. The reason that uh, sentient beings and that samsaric existence experience so much in the way of suffering is because of um, not having realized the essential, understood and realized the essential nature of one's mind. In order to become liberated from the sufferings of samsara, then one must understand and realize the nature of mind, for that the essential <coughs> way is to, to integrate the teachings of the Dharma in our life and towards that and we have to persevere on the path <coughs> Specific and uncommon preliminary is uh, the practice of Guru Yoga <coughs> for the support of uh, the spiritual master. <coughs> the general state of our mind is. Uh, uh, because of uh, much ignorance and uh, uh, karmic obscurations, beings do not have a clear sense of what uh, are negative and harmful activities that should be given up and what are wholesome activities that should be taken up. And so, <coughs> lacking the understanding in these uh, things, there is need for the guidance and direction. At the same time, 
Generally, uh, mind is uh, uh, very vulnerable in that uh, um, we can easily be influenced, changing from one situation to the other. If we encounter false spiritual friends, there's the possibility that we could be influenced by false spiritual friends if we uh, chance upon proper and good spiritual friends that we could be influenced by them. So <coughs> we remain in a situation where we are in some sense the victims of influence. Given that situation, then it's important that we have the opportunity to encounter proper spiritual friend in order to be influenced in a healthier way. In the uh, sutras, it is mentioned that in order for individuals to embark upon the path of the Dharma, the role of a spiritual friend or Kalyanamitra is the uh, most essential or the key element. And uh, this is true in the whole course of the Buddhist path, uh, from the moment of checking of uh, refuge and uh, then the entering the different stages of the path, the Mahayana and the Vajrayana, until from the moment of taking a refuge until one has reached to the tenth uh, bhumi on the level of the bodhisattvas and until one experiences complete enlightenment, there is the need for the guidance of a spiritual friend or the master. <coughs> and uh, and depending on the level of uh, uh, understanding and development, the spiritual friends can present in various different forms, in the form of ordinary individual spiritual friends, in the form of uh, the uh, spiritual friends uh, in of uh, Buddhas, and then further up, spiritual friends in the form of uh, bodhisattvas, so different to levels of spiritual friend. <coughs> in all of these levels, there is the need to have the guidance of spiritual friends, particularly in the 
Vajrayana and Mahamudra tradition. Uh, a spiritual friend who is the Lama or the Guru plays a significant role in that which is through receiving of the blessings of the Lama or the Guru that can affect very strongly the ones gaining realization and insight into the experience of Mahamudra. The reason for the importance of uh, the Lama, a spiritual master, in the Mahamadara path or tradition is first to be a spiritual master who has understanding and realization of Mahamadra introduces to the one or points out to the one with the help of uh, words the understanding of the nature of one's mind. And this will help one to gain some level of intellectual understanding of the nature of mind. But in order to have the realization or experiential insight into the nature of um, the mind, the experience of the realization cannot be uh, introduced or pointed out through the support of words, sound or uh, concepts. And in order for the realization to take place, then uh, one is very uh, highly dependent on the blessing of the Lama, of realization. So, towards receiving the inspiration and the blessings of the Lama, the practice of the yoga, for instance, is of great importance. So the practice of the Guru Yoga, receiving the body speech empowerment of the Lama, as well as the blessings, and this uh, uh, ripening and uh, inspiring one's being towards the realization or experience of insight. <laughs> In one's uh, spiritual journey, the role of the uh, Lama, the Guru, is significant in that uh, initially the Lama introduces to one and uh, helps one understand what actions and attitudes are uh, stores of negative karma that one should abandon, what actions and attitudes are sort of positive karma, a virtue that one should take up. And beginning this way, guiding on the path, and helping one understand the 
workings and the very nature of one's mind and bringing one further along <coughs> and towards uh, inspiring one towards the realization of the essential nature of one's mind. So in this way that <coughs> such a teacher who has played this kind of significant role in uh, nurturing one's spiritual journey for one the such a teacher is even more important than the Buddha in that that one has received this precious guidance and so because of as an appreciation of that having the deepest uh, attitude of gratitude to such Lama, a spiritual master, and having the attitude of expressing gratitude and devotion to such a Lama, and then the uh, out of devotion and gratitude and engaging in the practice of the Guru Yoga, the Guru Devotion. The very benefit of the purpose of engaging in the Guru Yoga, the Guru Devotion practice is whatever aspect of the teachings that one uh, has not understood so that one may be able to understand them through the inspiration and the blessings and through the inspiration and the blessings whatever hindrances and obstacles one may encounter on the path so that these obstacles and hindrances uh, become removed and uh, also through the inspiration and blessings bringing about the effect of uh, increasing of one's uh, the, uh, there is significant importance the practice plays for this reason one engages in the practice of the Guru Yoga. So much has uh, pointed out uh, the Shinan practice uh, with the support of the breath that has the message and the Shinan practice of um, uh, <coughs> appreciating ordinary minds that is free of any kinds of of your practice or experience uh, um, which I would like to hear what experience you have like some sense that this this is or this seems to be what uh, the ordinary mind is and so uh, anyone would like to give <coughs> an answer or comment uh, and the answer or comments should only come from people who are here for the first year. So, 
it doesn't have a uh, clear understanding of uh, the ordinary consciousness, ordinary mind, and uh, would uh, um, like to hear some more clarification, explanation from Rinpoche. And since one doesn't have a clear understanding of um, ordinary mind, then uh, uh, one wonders in the practice of meditation as to whether one should be uh, examining uh, what it is or where it is, so forth. Ramuji's uh, response is uh, in uh, there is uh, the uh, analytical approach that one can have at the time of post-meditation and the experiential approach within the session of the practice. Within the session of the uh, practice, by experiential approach, meaning just simply resting in the basic uh, awareness, state of basic awareness, and uh, if a thought occurs, which is ordinarily uh, negative, one doesn't uh, uh, suppress or analyze about it, simply resting, simply noticing the arising, and uh, given that awareness is present, then one notices the arising, and uh, remaining in the awareness of thought. Given that the thought is uh, uh, positive, still simply not following and uh, noticing and remaining in the awareness of it. And uh, <coughs> so in this way, uh, no examining or no intellectualizing involved in the actual session of practice. And uh, so when the thoughts occur, one uh, approaches them this way, but uh, in the situation, the gap where there is no thought, then also doing nothing about it, simply resting in the awareness of non-thought. And uh, then, in, so within the session, doing it this way, and outside of the session, in the post-meditation context, yes, one could uh, have an observing attitude in that uh, when negative intentions and what have you arising, and uh, with some kind of observing mind to uh, discard <coughs> such, and with positive and dharmic attitudes arising, noticing them and further uh, increasing or cultivating of them. <coughs> um, the comment or the question is, uh, uh, generally uh, one uh, has a very, one has aggressive and angry tendencies and uh, uh, presently those tendencies have uh, intensified and uh, so a certain amount of destructive uh, thoughts arise. And uh, uh, the uh, comment is that uh, in the uh, actual session of the meditation, uh, regardless of whatever thought arises, not to pay attention to them in terms of feeling them, simply relax into resting in the awareness of it. <coughs> Meditation practice, if, uh, for instance, the thought of uh, aggression arises, 
one should not at all look at it as uh, an obstacle in the practice, something that uh, is undesirably intruding. <coughs> Rather, the, on the contrary, the approach should be a method for inside is presenting itself and given that instead of um, trying to challenge it but putting back and resting in the awareness of its nature nature of whatever thought activities taking place stepping back and resting in the nature then when you do that, then simply you are uh, uh, experiencing and recognizing ordinary mind. The, the, the question is, uh, if one's uh, spiritual master, the Lama, has uh, passed away, then in what ways, from what sort of sphere uh, does the teaching or the guiding takes place and uh, would there be a change in the blessing of the, the Lama and uh, which is uh, a response is that uh, uh, there uh, would not be change in the blessings of the Lama and uh, or more precisely, if there is no change in the devotion of the student, then there will be no change in the blessing of the Lama. And uh, in what forms the teacher manifests, or in what forms the teachings manifest to one, um, while there are, of course, the classification of ordinary individual spiritual master, and uh, Bodhisattva spiritual masters and uh, incarnate spiritual master and incarnate Buddhas and so forth. But uh, uh, on what level it operates for one, or what level they operate depends on what level one's experience is taking place, what level one's realization in accordance with one's own capacities the blessings of the inspiration uh, would take place. So it depends on one's own capacities and the levels of development. <coughs> like this with uh, emotions and thoughts, then one notices them, but uh, there must be also the occurring of uh, subtle thoughts and emotions uh, which one does not seem to notice. And the uh, Buddha's uh, response is, yes, uh, uh, that is uh, quite true. That, uh, in fact, uh, that one notices the arising of those thoughts and emotion at all is a very uh, good um, start and uh, uh, so sort of the right track and uh, the beginning to notice at all. And uh, when one notices the thoughts or the emotions, one should by no means try to um, bring about some change to these uh, emotions or thoughts. Simply allow one's mind to rest in the undistracted awareness of whatever arises. And then as one carries on one's practice this way, first noticing the gross thoughts and emotions, then is able to rest in the undistracted awareness of them, and gradually, um, uh, stage by stage, one will also have to notice uh, subtle thoughts and emotions and uh, approach them in the same way. Thank you.
Third special preliminary having been pointed out to you um, that the ordinary consciousness, ordinary mind and uh, uh, the various comments that you have made in terms of uh, experience of anger or noticing of uh, gross thoughts and emotion are um, <coughs> very much uh, uh, relevant uh, or uh, in tune with ordinary uh, minds. And uh, now in applying the fourth uh, special preliminary that whatever in the way of thoughts and experiences do arise that uh, one's mind should be free of uh, expectations and uh, uh, fears or hopes and fears and uh, neither fearing the possibility of some negative thoughts and emotions taking place in the way of uh, anger or whatever, nor hoping for uh, uh, positive thoughts or experiences to arise in the way of, of compassion or kindness and what have you. And so neither having hopes nor having hopes for better nor having fears of a worse or something negative coming about. Simply resting in the awareness, undistracted awareness of whatever occurs, whatever arises. And also what is being pointed out is that if a uh, a thought or emotion of anger arises that one should simply rest in the undistracted awareness of that thought arising and there one should not have any element of doubt thinking that uh, could this really be the practice part of the practice that one has to do this and so whatever occurs um, without making any so sort of discrimination from conventional point of view, simply resting in the unrestricted awareness of any occurrences is application of the fourth of the uh, special foundation. <laughs> you who have uh, asked questions and uh, In connection with uh, anger or the rising of gross uh, emotions for anger, through this thought, you have recognized on the mind. So simply rest in the undistracted awareness of ordinary mind through these occurrences. For those of you who have not made comments, but if your experiences have been uh, seemingly positive in the way of uh, compassion and kindness and what have you, uh, don't think that uh, you have to have anger to recognize uh, ordinary mind, so don't be disappointed simply rest in the awareness of uh, whatever in the way of compassion, thoughts or emotions of compassion or kindness that has occurred. And rest 
esteem, the understanding, awareness of such occurrences is also uh, the recognizing uh, of the mind. And still those of you who neither had positive, seemingly positive thoughts and emotions in the way of compassion and kindness, those seemingly negative thoughts and emotions in the way of uh, anger and what have you, also don't have this idea that uh, you've got to create some kind of thought, some kind of active thought in order to uh, recognize other minds. And uh, uh, <coughs> simply rest in the awareness of non-thought, undistracted awareness of the non-thought non that is experience of ordinary mind. So whatever may be the occurrences, be it absence, be it uh, uh, seemingly positive uh, thoughts taking place, or negative thoughts taking place, or gap without thought, are uh, all that appropriate uh, uh, situations for 